Hi everyone. Let me tell you a story, not just about a warship, but about a legend. A ship that earned the respect of sailors, the fear of enemies, and the admiration of naval historians. Her name? USS Fletcher. Hull number DD-445. The very first of her kind, and a destroyer that would go on to change the course of naval warfare. She slipped into the water in 1942, during the darkest days of World War II, when every ship that joined the fleet carried with it a question. Will she survive? Will she fight well? Will she bring our boys home? Fletcher wasn't just an answer to those questions, she was the blueprint for how destroyers would fight for the rest of the war. She led a class of 175 ships, the largest destroyer class ever built by the United States. But she wasn't just the first, she was one of the finest. When you look at her silhouette in 1944, the year many consider her prime, you see a ship built for one thing, war. Five powerful 5-inch guns lined her deck, capable of tearing into enemy ships or blasting aircraft out of the sky. Ten torpedo tubes waited in readiness, able to cripple cruisers or send even battleships to the bottom. Radar swept the skies and seas, long before the enemy even knew she was there. And beneath her decks, a crew of nearly 300 men, young and determined, who would sail her into the heart of danger. USS Fletcher didn't sit idle. She was in the thick of it, from Guadalcanal to Leyte Gulf, from Iwo Jima to Okinawa. Wherever the fight was fiercest, Fletcher was there. She landed troops, shelled beaches, shot down kamikaze planes, and outmaneuvered enemy ships in midnight duels under black skies lit only by tracer fire and explosions. She fought in 42 combat operations, earned 15 battle stars, and somehow, she survived it all. But what made her truly remarkable wasn't just firepower or armor, it was her adaptability. Fletcher could do it all. Escort carriers, chase submarines, rescue down pilots, pick up survivors from sinking ships. She was fast, tough reliable. And long after World War II ended, she came back, answering the call again during the Korean War, decades after her first launch, still proving her worth in the jet age. Recreating her is like bringing a part of naval history to life. You're not just building a ship, you're building a memory, a moment, a machine that once roared across the Pacific, carrying the hopes of a nation. Before she ever sliced through the waters of the Pacific, before her guns roared in anger and her crew faced fire under starlit skies, USS Fletcher began as a vision, a blueprint, a response to a rapidly changing war, and a bold step forward in destroyer design. In the late 1930s, the world was on edge. Across oceans, navies were growing, modernizing, preparing. And the US Navy, it knew that the next war would demand more than just speed and firepower. It would demand flexibility, endurance, and survivability. She was 376 feet long, displacing just over 2,500 tons fully loaded, a substantial increase over previous destroyers. That extra size meant more room for fuel, ammunition, and, most importantly, guns and what guns they were. Her main battery consisted of five 5-inch, 38-caliber dual-purpose guns, perhaps the most celebrated naval gun of its era. Why, because it could do everything. This wasn't just a weapon for surface duels, it was a deadly anti-aircraft gun too. Controlled by advanced fire control radar, the 5 inches, 38 had speed, range, and accuracy. It was so effective, so reliable, that it became standard armament on nearly every major US warship, destroyers, cruisers, battleships, and even aircraft carriers. 
it stayed in service long after the war, a testament to its timeless design. But Fletcher's bike didn't end there. She carried 10 21-inch torpedo tubes, arranged in two quintuple mounts, a serious threat to enemy cruisers and battleships. She had depth charge racks and K-gun throwers to fight submarines, and a growing array of anti-aircraft weapons as the war intensified, including 40mm Bofors and 20mm Ehrlichons by 1944. Her radar and fire control systems gave her eyes in the darkness and reach beyond the horizon. She could fight day or night, in storm or sun, and hit targets before they knew she was there. Inside, the ship was a living machine. Steam turbines gave her over 60,000 horsepower, enough to propel her at 38 knots, more than fast enough to run with carriers or race to intercept threats. Her design set the standard. She was rugged, deadly, and adaptable. Over 170 ships followed her, and many survived not only World War II, but served again in Korea, and even into the Cold War, sold to Allied navies. The armament, sensors, and fire control systems installed on Fletcher-class destroyers are examined in detail in the video series about USS Missouri, BB-63. A link to those videos can be found in the description of this video. The series covers their operating principles, blueprints, and use in combat operations. Let's look back at where her story truly began, in 1942, at the heart of the Pacific War. She arrived at Noumea in early October and was thrown straight into the Guadalcanal campaign. Just weeks later, she was bombarding Lunga Point and defending troop landings against enemy air attacks. Her guns roared on November 12, shooting down aircraft as Japanese bombers swarmed the fleet. Then came the naval battle of Guadalcanal, a brutal, chaotic three-day fight. On November 13, Fletcher joined a nighttime surface battle, firing guns and launching torpedoes. Two enemy destroyers were sunk, and the battleship EA was left crippled, soon destroyed by American aircraft. But Fletcher wasn't done. On November 30, she led another task force to intercept Japanese reinforcements at Tassafaronga. Her radar made the first contact. The battle was fierce, one enemy ship sunk, several US cruisers damaged. Fletcher avoided major hits and switched to rescue duty, saving survivors from the sinking cruiser Northampton. By 1943, USS Fletcher was no longer a newcomer. She was a battle-tested veteran, and the Solomon Islands remained her hunting ground. She spent the year patrolling the waters around Guadalcanal, shelling enemy positions, and driving off Japanese air raids. She rescued downed aviators, sank enemy landing barges, and guarded new Allied landings along the northern coast. On February 11, during a routine patrol, a signal flare dropped by a reconnaissance plane from the cruiser Helena caught her attention. Fletcher raced to the spot, and successfully located and sank the Japanese submarine I-18. It was a sharp, clean kill, made possible by coordination, skill, and speed. Just 10 days later, she was covering the landings on the Russell Islands, and in early March, her guns thundered through the night, bombarding the Japanese airfield at Munden on New Georgia. After months of intense duty, she headed to Sydney, Australia, for a short refit in April and early May. But rest was brief. She was soon back in action, escorting convoys, protecting supply routes, and screening the fleet. In June, she left Espiritu Santo for a full overhaul back in the States, returning to the Pacific in late September, and immediately resumed her patrols around Noumea. By November, she joined a carrier task force providing air support for the invasion of the Gilbert Islands. When Japanese aircraft counterattacked on November 26, Fletcher's guns opened up once again. Just a week later, on December 4, she was in action again, 
firing at enemy planes during a strike near Kwabdulin Island. As 1944 began, USS Fletcher was sharper, faster, and more experienced than ever. After a brief overhaul and training off the US West Coast, Fletcher joined the push toward the Marshall Islands. In late January, she screened troop transports from San Diego, then joined a bombardment group, striking Wuch Atoll on the 30th. The very next day, she was with the main invasion force at Kwajalein, protecting transports and patrolling the atoll as Marines stormed the beaches. By mid-February, Fletcher was screening battleships during fierce shore bombardments at Taro and Wuch, then patrolling around Eniwetok, as the U.S. island hopping campaign pressed forward. But the Pacific was vast, and the mission never stopped. By April, she was off New Guinea, supporting the Humboldt Bay landings, and soon after, covering reinforcements, bombarding enemy positions, and patrolling against submarines. In October, Fletcher sailed with the invasion force, screening transports as they landed the first wave of troops in what would become the battle to liberate the Philippines. She cleared the Gulf just before the great naval battle began, but her work wasn't done. In November and December, she returned with reinforcements, escorted convoys, fired pre-landing barrages at Oromoc Bay and Mindoro, and once again faced enemy air attacks, helping to beat them back with her battle-proven guns. By the end of 1944, Fletcher had covered thousands of miles, supported landings across half the Pacific, and stood firm through countless operations. As 1945 dawned, the war in the Pacific was entering its final and most brutal phase, and USS Fletcher was still on the front line. On January 4, she sailed from San Pedro Bay, escorting the Luzon attack force. Japanese aircraft came in waves on January 8, and Fletcher opened fire, shooting at least one down. But her most dangerous mission came in February. Fletcher joined operations to retake Bataan and Corregidor, names etched in blood since 1942. While engaging Japanese shore batteries at Los Cochinos Point, Fletcher was hit. Eight sailors were killed. Three were wounded. But the ship kept firing, and kept fighting. Moments later, Fletcher began rescue operations, pulling survivors from the stricken YMS-48, also hit by enemy fire. She supported landings at Palawan, Zamboanga, and Tarakan, guarded minesweepers, escorted convoys, and patrolled Philippine waters until May 13, when she finally sailed home for overhaul. After the war, she remained in reserve, a ship that had seen more action, more danger, and more victories than most ever would. USS Fletcher didn't just survive the war. She helped win it. Thanks for watching.